Dunia sedang berubah, ASEAN sedang berubah, Malaysia juga sedang berubah. Revolusi industri keempat menjengah. Tapi hari ini, hari pertama, Koma, Content and Communication Forum untuk ASEAN, persidangan yang meletakkan pemikir-pemikir pendapat berada di sini, kita mempunyai banyak rahsia-rahsia yang sudah dibicarakan. Anda boleh mengetahui sebahagian daripadanya kerana malam ini, agenda awal ini secara langsung dari Koma, Shangri-La, Kuala Lumpur. Jumpa selepas ini. Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera. You are watching a very, very special edition of Agenda Wani live right here from the heart of the Central Business District, not at the Financial Hill where we are, Bukit Kewangan, Bursa, but for the first time ever right here in Hotel Shangri-La, the first birthplace of Koma, the Content and Communication Forum or Summit for ASEAN. And uh, we've talked about this. You know, people talk about frenemies a lot in this uh, today's session, but we are kindred spirit because we both never walk alone. So I've made that point. <laughs> in communication, that's called establishing relationship and uh, rapport. That's very good. I feel the bond. Uh, yes. Good. And now I have to give the trust of the knife, <laughs> which is, if it's the death of advertising, the rise of PR, there were real worries over the last, let's say, five years. Hmm about the total value and worth of the PR industry globally. In 2015, it went down by a few percentage points. However, for last year, I was reading one of the reports, I think it was the Holmes report, uh, it rose up 7% to about 15 billion US dollars globally. So, is that the death, death throes before the fourth industrial revolution? Or is that PR being what it is since the beginning, morphing and moving along because communications never die? I think it's a very, I mean, it's, it's a good question when you talk about PR versus advertising. I'll start with one point. I mean, first of all, um, you know, all communication now is, is merging. Everything is becoming holistic. So you have uh, media companies that are creating content. Uh, you have PR companies that create advertising campaigns and brand strategy. And likewise, <clears throat> you have advertising agencies who themselves are also in the getting into the influence game. So I see PR as a very, very important tool. And I've seen the Holmes report uh, numbers. The numbers are up. The reason why the numbers are up for PR is because of the rise of social media. So if you look at uh, the way social media operates, if you try and force your brand into a situation, if you try and force your message into a situation, you will automatically self-select. So if you are audience aware, if you are brand aware, um, you can actually create content that people themselves want to select for themselves and then share amongst their social Correct. networks. Yeah. So there's been some great talk actually um, this week for some work that's been done for Christie's, mm -hmm. so they are auctioning a Van Gogh right. painting. And the 
PR that's been done for that has been done by an advertising agency, by Droga5 in, uh, mm -hmm. in America. And all it is is pictures and cameos of people looking in amazement at this wonderful portrait that will go on sale in the next few months. It's doing a world tour at the moment. Now, that, that is the perfect type of content. That creates the perfect type of PR, but it's a film. Is that PR? Yeah. Is that influence? Is yeah. that content? Is it advertising? Mm -hmm. There's no brand in there. There's no message mm -hmm. in there. All it does is make people want to know more. And okay. I think that's the fundamental role of PR. Uh, uh, and, you know, you mentioned, you know, has PR changed? And I would imagine that PR has changed fundamentally from the PR of 5, 10, 15 years yes. ago. But the essentials of PR have never changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PR is all about making sure that one person takes a message to the masses. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm not, well, I'm not surprised that PR is growing, but I've always seen PR as an essential ingredient in getting the thing getting I the like about out. digital disruption is it's supposed to be based on the new oil, which is data. Yeah. And data strings strung together can become information, useful information at that. Yeah, can. So if we come from that angle, we, PR and media, TV broadcast, whatever, would never die because that's our blood, right? And Correct. now it's our age because it's oil is it's no longer oil, petroleum, but the new oil is data. But having said that, the traditional form would have to be disrupted because the whole things they have all changed. Because people don't consume information the places they used to. They don't do it the way they used to. Even the timing of when they consume information has changed. So how would you like to manage the disruption of PR, especially in an Asian country like Malaysia? Well, I think um, I'll take There's two points that you mentioned there. Well, first of all, the, the data point, and then secondly, PR in, in Malaysia. I think, I think the data debate is a very, very interesting one. You know, I mean, there is... Uh, a huge amount of data out there and obviously you know people are collecting more and more data because they are able to collect more data machines are able to analyze more data and data you know if you know where to look in the data is a, is a huge enabler for brands it's a massive enabler for companies Correct. but also it's an inhibitor so on the one hand it's an enabler in being able to identify new audiences it's an enabler to be able to find sort of patterns in behavior um, it's an enabler now it's an enabler to be able to find out from you know, geolocations where people actually are, Correct. what their buying behavior looks yes. like when they're there and stuff like that. So that's very good if you're identifying new audiences. One of the inhibitors, uh, I would argue, of data is the fact that when people come and um, when the, those patterns start to emerge in terms of their behavior, their buying behavior and, and, and stuff like that, um, the data starts to serve up things that they think you would like okay, okay? Yes. and what all that does in my opinion is start to narrow your field of vision mm -hmm. and i think that the you know the the the, the, the right brain of the of, of the body has always been the inquisitive has yeah. always been the, the curious, primary mover yeah. always, that's right has always been the bit that's like interested to know okay. more so we have to make sure that data doesn't uh somehow um you know, just doesn't somehow just sort of box us in or, or vanillaize us in some way like that. You David, know? I always say that there's one thing that we cannot disrupt, and that is time. Nobody has invented something to replace time. It's very true. So my crew will go crazy if I don't go to, for the first commercial break, which works well for you and me. But when you come back, that question about Malaysia, I want to lay on top of it the promise of, I think, after President Donald Trump, I think PR really have to look at itself. Because what is PR uh, 140 characters on a tweet from the White House, for example? So we, we're going to go from Washington to Malaysia. This is a kind of fluid conversation. And that's the advantage of Coma. You still have time to enroll for the second half, the second day tomorrow. We'll catch you after the short break.
I agree with that. It's, uh, it's, the, it's a great time. You are still watching a live session of Gaidah Wani. I'm already discussing <laughs> with great people. You never have time. So always still time during commercial breaks. Well, I'll share that with you. Before the break, you were going to go into the, your views on the PR industry in Malaysia. The reason I asked and I was telling you that during the break is that in the newsroom, we will daily get stuff from the PR agencies, including your staff, who would give us press releases. But uh, Awadi has gone digital, and we now look at screens rather than emails for press releases. Mm. We look at this thing called Chartbeat and CrowdTangle that show us what is trending, what is not, what is being said, what is discussed. Of course, we still check on press releases, but it's not the main driver anymore. Mm. So if, at, um, if I'm in the supply chain of the Malaysian PR industry in terms of receiving the product, that key product that has always been the staple diet mm. is no longer my staple diet. Mm. So mm. that point, I'm trying to make the connection to you. How do you change the PR industry in Malaysia? Well, I, look, I think at its heart, I mean, you know, with the, with the proliferation of media opportunities, media channels that people have now, I think that getting, for brands to get their message out, I mean, the essential part of a press release is to obviously get a, get a brand in front of its yeah. audience, okay? Yeah. So there are two things that need to happen there. I think, first of all, obviously it needs some, some sort of salient information. There has to be something in there that people would be interested in. And when I say people, I mean the editors that are actually yeah. screening what's coming in. Yeah. I think the second thing, though, is this whole idea of the relationship. Um, it's not enough now just to send you uh, a press release and you know, hope to hell that you read it. There's a little bit of pre-sell, but maybe, maybe the PR or the press release itself needs a little bit of its own PR yeah. to make you pick it up. So if you are looking at those trending sites, which I know that you guys do, that's really your new feed. For the brands to get in there, they need to be on the feed first. Mm -hmm. So there's a pre-job to be done in sort of like making sure that that is primed first of all, it's already in your head, yeah. and that then you're prepared to read the press release and go into it in a little bit more detail. I want to link that before we go to Trump. I think PR agencies being at the front line understands this very well. But PR agencies have to serve clients. Mm. Clients sometimes, being clients, of course they're the pay master, but they are detached from the front lines mm. of where these changes are being disrupted. Mm. So they would still want to push it the old way. I have this event coming, please send this press release telling people. Yeah. But uh, editors like me, that's the first thing that I don't want to look at. Yeah. I want to look at how is anything connected to anything that's relevant to the people. Yeah. So if there's a cat show somewhere, you know, possibly I'm not going to look at it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So how do you move the awareness of the fourth industrial revolution up to the paymasters, which is very, very tricky? It's a really good... I mean, you know, the idea... I think the PR that you've just described, um, you know, in the industry, we call it buns, cakes and balloons. Mm -hmm. But just... Old-fashioned PR, it could be like a, you know, like a, a lunch for your partners or, or whatever. A lot of the stuff that PR used to do is now part of a broader sort of event strategy. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're talking about, I mean, we, we meet a lot of clients in the PR field and everybody is asking for um, new PR, influence PR, sort of fresh PR, viral PR, mm -hmm. social PR. All right. And all of that is possible, but you must have a purpose at the centre of it. And one of the things that we've done, I think, quite well, certainly at Ogilvy and Mather, is to make sure that we have a central body of thinking that all disciplines can feed from, knowing that they will rub up against each other at some point. And the rubbing up against each other is what creates that wonderful creative friction mm -hmm. that means that things actually stand out. So I've had a client here in Malaysia, actually, very recently saying, I want modern PR and I want influential PR. Okay. But I still want to do what I was doing before. Give me an example of one act of influential PR. One act of influential PR that comes more or less immediately to mind is Fearless Girl okay. from, uh, from New York. Uh, you know, the, have you seen that? The bull on, on Wall Street and they put a girl in front okay. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that was done by the charity that it represented. It was driven by McCann Erickson, which was their advertising agency. But essentially all they did was they put a girl in front of the bull and the symbolism of that, everything that the world is talking about today, everything that's talking about the world of possibilities, right. uh, Wall Street and how that needs to calm down, equality, women in the workplace. I mean, it's going on around us right now. But as that story unfolds, Fearless Girl was right at the center of everything. And that single act of just putting something 
putting the girl in front of the bull drove hours and hours and hours of content. Everybody had a point of view on it. Everybody realised that it just stood at the very, very centre of like a big world debate that was going on at that point. And it was good for the charity. It raised a huge amount of money. It saved a huge amount of media because people wanted to talk about it because it was relevant yeah. to them. Mm -hmm. And the brand made it relevant to themselves at the same Rather time. Rather than push, you make people pull. Absolutely. The Absolutely. Them. I have yeah. to go for the last break, but once we are back, I promise the audience Trump. I will ask you about Trump. Uh, by the way, o &M was not engaged by Trump, right, for the presidential <laughs> election. I don't know. I will ask <laughs> David that. Oh, but the, the point is... <laughs> Hillary Clinton's team outspent the Trump campaign by three times over for TV spending ads and, you know, everything else. So that's one thing. So more resources doesn't mean better campaign, messaging and initiative. And in this country, you know, people saying that, okay, so you sell newspapers, so you have TV content, just migrate them to the digital platform. We did that. We did that way above and beyond. But the edX or advertising expenditure didn't want to play ball. That's one of the session here at Coma. When we move that in, edX behaves, works and originates differently in digital. So let's talk about that with the greatest mind industry and this this neighborhood after the short break. Very special live session of again I want you right here from Shangri-La because this is where Omar is content and communication summit for ASEAN digital disruptions is in it disrupts everything and when communication disrupts data is disrupted the flow the pattern the whatever so everything else is involved so we're not still talking with the maestro of PR uh, David is now going <laughs> to tell us why is it the poor Hillary Clinton's team did everything right by the book. All the pundits, all the rating agencies, whatever have you, they were all saying that they were going to win. But Trump decided to do almost guerrilla in that sense. You know, really look at social media, spend his resources there, use analytics to look at redneck Americans driving red, uh, redneck cars, yeah. like made in American uh, gasoline, gas, guzzling cars. <laughs> And he hit it on the deal. So can we use that analogy for the era that we're in right now? I think, uh, I mean, how wrong the pundits were. You know, I mean, everybody was going for Hillary. Everybody wanted it to be Hillary. And I think that's what they were prepared to believe. I mean, and Hillary got impact. I mean, you're right. She, she outspent the Trump campaign, I think, as you say, threefold or so. I mean, yeah, the numbers were absolutely enormous. But what Trump had was engagement. And he also, he, he was in an enviable position because he was in a number, he was a number two. Yep. So the number one becomes the enemy. Right. Because everybody in the world always wants to become number one. And then when you're number one, you have a high class headache, which is defending your position. Right. So as an attacker, uh, Trump had a following wind. I mean, a lot of dissent on the ground. And all he did was tap into that. And his messages were very basic. His language was very unpolitical, uh, unpolitically correct. And he tapped into a vein of complete dissatisfaction, not just in America, but in the world. Um, and, and they voted him in. So, you know, I think he was right place at the right time. I think he was incredibly lucky with the mood of the nation. He's clearly a man that knows very well how to read an audience and get people riled up in that way. We thought that was it. He's in the White House. Yeah. But no, it isn't. Yeah. He fired his, you know, communications chief of staff or whatever yeah. at will. And then he just tweets. And now the official communique of the White House is just 140 characters. Thank That's God right. for 280 now. I just wonder whether they've extended them so that Donald can you know, put his foot even further into his mouth, perhaps. I'm not sure. But the, the tradition of the mainstream, they are amplifying it. They are waiting for his next tweet. Yes, but I mean, he's turned it into quite an interesting, uh, you know, it's a sort of, sort of them and us, isn't it? It's like a big fat game of tennis. You know, he says something, he knows that they're going to report it. So he, the more he antagonizes them, the more they feel that they need to defend. And, and so it goes on. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very sort of haphazard way of communicating. 
and it's very sort of personality led. I suppose in a brand context, if brands could be as natural about themselves as Donald Trump is about himself, you know, I I wonder whether they might go a little bit further than right. being, you know, sort of constrained and controlled all the time. I don't time have perhaps. time to discuss with you today about fake news. Hopefully somebody will raise it tomorrow <laughs> in your session. I'm sure they will actually. But yeah. this new era, I'm sure you have to look at programmatics, analytics, machine learning, big data in the whole ecosystem and the gamut of it. Yeah. So it's not that easy to be in comms and PR advertising anymore. Things are converging. It's becoming more technologically sophisticated. And sometimes you don't know who owns the rules because it seems like the telco, they hold the pipelines. Same mm -hmm. time, wait. You know, you have the technology companies who's disrupting everything, yeah. then, hey, content is still king. Yeah. So how do you weave yeah. PR across? I think, I, I mean, you know, the, with everything that's going on in the world, there is a huge amount of, you know, disruption. You use the word, uh, and there are no rules. And even if there were rules, the rules will be changing as we're playing the game. Is so that frightening? I think it's frightening, but I think it's very, very exciting as well. And what, what's, what's interesting about our industry is that, you know, I think in the past it was always advertising that led was always on the leading edge of culture. I wouldn't say it led culture, right. but it was always able to reflect the leading edge of culture. And I think suddenly with the very rapid speed of change, literally over the last sort of, you know, 12, 18, 24 months or so, I think, a lot, I think the industry's been caught napping. I'm going to give you a one-liner. You are good at this. You are in PR. <laughs> What's the one-liner to describe your coming session tomorrow morning? Well, we are going to... I will, what's my one-liner? That's, uh, that's a tough one. We're basically going to be uh, disrupting alone, yeah. the disruptors when okay. it comes to disrupting ADEX. Disrupting the disruptors. That's themselves. what we're doing tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> See? Thank you so much, David, for Thank making time to be on yeah, this fantastic. special session. Thank you very much, Thanks indeed. to you. <laughs> you can still join us. You can still come to Shangri-La. Don't worry about how to register. Just come here. Slew of people, good-looking ones to help you register and get enrolled. But you only get half of it. So we give you half price for it. But uh, all the discussions since yesterday are very, very premium because I've never been at a session discussing the fourth industrial revolution with very specific local relevance. Not even in last January in Davos. And uh, I'll see you very, very soon in another episode of Agenda Wani. Send in your own views to all the social media accounts that we have. Plus, download our iOS and Android applications. Good evening, good night, and goodbye. Thank you, David.